Sarah Albadwi here from Horse Racing Nation, joined by another HRN analyst, Chase Sessoms at of Oaklawn on Twitter. Thanks for coming on to talk some Travers Day action with me. How are you doing? I you might have to clear that title with Mark. I'm not sure if I if I deserve it quite yet, but uh, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's a great week of racing. A tough card at Saratoga today. A nice little difficult card tomorrow for the New York Bread races and. Uh, I mean, a chock full of star power Travers Day. I mean, you've been doing well enough with your selections at the track. I feel like it's fair enough to say that, you know, you're, you're official HRN family now. I know you had Mirth and Merriment last week on Friday. That was a great pick. Yeah, I love that horse. Uh, that's I, I, I want to say I was on that horse before, but yeah, it was just one of those rare times that early speed could get away. And uh, yeah, nice little price. It's, uh, it seems like a, when all hope is lost at the end, end of the day sort of thing i've been able to come up with a couple of those prices if you can get anybody home at a price at saratoga and have yourself a day saver i feel like you're doing pretty well so <laughs> yeah yeah check all my boxes as long as i can get a combo meal on the way home i'm good <laughs> right well we're going to go over the mandatory payout pick five. There's four grade ones in there. It culminates with the Travers. There's a allowance race to start things off. Are you much of a pick five player? Do you usually do different sort of multis or more just exotics within a certain race? Uh, if I see a sequence that's worth the investment and I think that it will pay to justify the investment, then I'll, I'll, I'll play a pick five or pick six. Usually I don't like to stretch a lot further than a pick three. I really like just hammering my best opinions and daily doubles typically, though. I mean, I feel like that's kind of been the way to go at this meet. It's hard to connect all of those dots so far mm -hmm. in Saratoga. Yeah, I had a heartbreaker day uh, a couple weeks back where I was – live to two horses in the late pick five for a couple thousand and missed it and then went across to Del Mar and did the exact same thing uh, later in that day. Um, just time to cry in the shower after that. <laughs> yeah, there's plenty of those days where it's like you ha have some really great idea at a price and things just come up a little bit short. But, you know, it's it's reassuring in a way that it's such a tough meet for everybody. But I think yep. this is also the kind of meet that teaches you so much about your gameplay, what your weaknesses are, what your strengths are, and really just makes you better for the rest of the year. So then you can go have those days where you cry in the shower after every day at Saratoga for next year. Right, right. It's uh, <laughs> fortunately the spa's been kind to me, though. So I just uh, I cherish these days because if you don't put the work in, they don't stick around. Very true. All right. Well, I couldn't really come up with a super strong ticket that seemed affordable enough for me to punch and give out to everybody else within the uh, YouTube community that's going to be watching within this sequence. I kind of tried the $5 base approach for the Belmont Stakes Day pick five. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With this one, it's like, what am I going to tell you to do? I really like this short price favorite in here and in here and in here. So my approach is more just Here's a horse that I really like that makes a lot of sense and that everybody's probably going to use. But then here's another long shot to maybe consider for your ticket. So that's kind of the strategy with which I approached my analysis for this video. And starting off with race seven, we're going five and a half furlongs on the turf. I'm really curious to see how the courses end up playing this week. Mm -hmm. As of this recording, we haven't had any turf racing since they were off for Wednesday. The rails are going to be changing positions do you kind of look at those biases that we've seen so far and what you expect to change, or are you just going to kind of wait and see one? I What I'd like to do is at least come up with a, a I guess, hypothesis of how I think the track bias will play, uh, even during the day, different points in the day, because if I can guess it right before people are figuring it out, there's more chance for me to be able to put in a bet with, you know, a bet with good value until people start, you know, pounding the, bi uh, the bias. So, uh, when I look at five and a half, I always look at where the temp rails are set. I believe the temp rails are completely down for this, which uh, in my opinion, always opens up the inside posts a lot more. Uh, so I think early speed that's drawn down on that rail, they don't get pinched in by the outside uh, speed, it seems like. So I'm, I'm more uh, apt to take a chance at a more in inwardly drawn, you know, early pace horse in, in this kind of race. And was there somebody that you saw that you really liked in this one that kind of fits? Yeah. Number number five, Ranger Fox, seven to two on the uh, morning line. Took a big step forward in his last uh, start. If he takes another step forward, a easy winner, I think. Uh, horizontally, I'm going to 
lo- use every horse that kind of loosely fits uh, Ranger Fox's profile of a horse that's going to be forwardly placed because for five and a half furlongs, I don't think that this pace gets overly hot. So I definitely want someone who's going to be near the front. And uh, the only other two that I had were the three discrete tune at four to one and the seven uh, Casadero at eight to one. So three, five, seven for me in the first leg. Yeah, Carazadero definitely piqued my interest as well. I think this is something that you and I talked about the last time when I talked to you for your podcast of a horse that just kind of like, what are you doing here? And it makes absolutely right. no sense. We talked about this angle with tax. Uh, with Casadero, this is first time turf for this horse. And this is one that really started off looking like a very promising two-year-old when he was in the Aspison barn. He had those back-to-back wins that included the Bashford Manor. He was actually favored over Jackie's Warrior in the Saratoga Special. And then he's kind of just been okay since. He's had a couple of uh, chunks of time that have gone missing. They keep trying to bring him back. He's in a new barn now with Brendan Walsh. I mean, there's two recorded turf works, and there's some pedigrees to suggest that he'll appreciate it. I mean, the dam won a grade three on the synthetic. The siblings have run well over the grass. And just on a price, and who knows, this is one that I definitely wanted to include, as well as kind of the obvious horse that I've always been a fan of as well with Ranger Fox. So Casadero definitely piques my interest in here, too. I And I like seeing, uh, you know, in this case, the ultimate equipment change, but changes to these horses like what are we doing different to get them in the winter circle in this case the the, the most extreme e- equipment change but yeah uh like like seeing the change in the horse getting kind of look pretty focused workouts uh, heading into this yeah i definitely wanted to make sure that i had some sort of price as well um noble emotion and comedy town they exit the same race and they're going to be facing each other again in here that was a race that dancing buck won comedy town was a huge price in there I just don't know how strong that race was. Fauci was third in there. That's a horse I've been chasing for a very long time who really just doesn't win and has been extremely frustrating for me. So I feel like I'm kind of biased and sour on any event that he comes out of and horses that haven't been able to beat him or horses that kind of just barely get the job done over him like Comedy Town. Right. Yeah, I I honestly, I, I didn't consider uh, Comedy Town. I didn't consider... Um, uh, the other horse you mentioned either. Um, I, I don't know. I, I wanted to, I could either make a case for putting in basically everybody, but the favorite or just trimming to three and just being like, okay, I'm taking this. This is the hill I die on in the first. Yeah. I'm with you there. And I think that you kind of have to really trim your opinions, especially if you like some of the shorter price favorites in here, which in the Allen Jerkins in race number eight, seven furlongs. What do you think about Jack Christopher returning to a sprint distance? I'm going to try to beat Jack Christopher. Um, yes, I think this is probably the best horse in this race, but I actually really like uh, what I'm seeing out of Gunite. Uh, number eight, uh, I believe, I want to say six to one on the morning line. Uh, ran a huge race in the Amsterdam, just continues to trend up for Aspison. This is about the time when Aspison's, you know, sprinters start kicking butt and sprint distances. And, uh, you know, I'm not too worried about the, the pairing with uh, Gaffleyome because Aspison does pretty good work with them. And uh, I, I think it's a good way to beat a favorite. And I think this was one of the races where you had to say, okay, I'm on J- Jack Christopher single or I'm, I'm taking other shots. And I think, I think this is not going to be my, my strong favorite of single. It's going to be a uh, gunite, but also I'm going to use uh, actuator uh, who I thought could run just kind of off the pace a little bit. And then, uh, or sorry, uh, a little more forwardly place. And then uh, a credit, I guess the uh, Chad Brown on the outside uh, in the nine hole uh, because if this race does fall apart, which big stakes day at Naira doesn't always necessarily happen like we think it will. Uh, but if it does, a creative is the horse is going to pick up the pieces. Yeah. I mean, both him and Gunite ran huge last time. Uh, that was, I think the day to get your best price on Gunite. but at the same time, you're also getting a great price in here because of the presence of Jack Christopher, who I feel like he didn't really run that badly in the Haskell, but at the same time, it was very clear that that was not, really one of his a performances and I, I get that okay it's we're all just gonna assume it's the distance but was it I mean I, we're gonna find out for sure but sure look I mean I I've been a huge fan of Jack Christopher for a long time like you said I think we're just looking at the best horse in the race and to me with gun and Conagher both in here bookending the field kind of what creative just to gun outside but they're coming from both angles I feel like they're both going to go early. I know that Gunite showed that he could survive pace pressure and keep on going, but that was six and a half. 
This is sure. seven. I think that we kind of get to see more of those specialized sprinters at different distances. And I think the sh little bit of change in terms of the distance does really matter when you're talking about sprinters like this, whether it's six, six and a half, seven. And a horse that I really wanted to use at a price in all of my exotics was the two, running son of a gun. I mean, this is okay. my kind of horse. He always shows up and outruns his odds. He is always a huge price when he's facing this kind of competition. He ran third last time. He's seven for eight in the money. He was 56 to one last time. And I really like the seven for long distance for a horse like this. Plus, they're also putting the blinkers on. So I wonder if they want him to sit a little bit closer. I think that he's going to get a similar kind of pace set up. And I don't know that he wins. He's probably just not good enough to get by some of these horses. But I definitely want him in an exacta try supers. I want him somewhere underneath at a huge price. So uh, I, I've got a way that I play these seven furlong races, and I've actually come up with a nice little mnemonic device rhyme for it. Seven furlong races, one through three is dead to me. Four or more, <laughs> big friggin' score. Uh, I hate horses that get drawn to the inside in those first three holes on seven furlongs. It is tough sledding there. I was thinking about what makes it like that. I, I don't know. I think it's because... They're exiting the turn, and maybe they kind of veer into it a little bit, so they're not right at the rail. I don't, I don't necessarily know, but uh, I just look back through the results and see some very, very heavy favorites drawn to the inside. And these seven furlong races go down. Um, Matarea, that's one of them. Um, so yeah, that's that's why I focused on Gunite on the outside and also Credit. Uh, uh, you know actuators a little bit close where if I get a scratch, then it will unfortunately have to be dead to me, but uh, hopefully that won't happen. All right. Well, that's interesting. I'm curious to see how that plays out. And it's definitely going to be something that I look for going forwards in the personal ensign. Now we're going a mile and an eighth. This is a race that was won by Latruska last year. She does reappear in this race. I mean, are we just dealing with a situation where she's taken a step backwards or do you think that that was kind of just a one-off, uncharacteristically bad kind of performance last time for the sake of my uh, own heart and emotions. I'm going to say that it was just one, it just one bad race and she'll shake it off. I mean, she's had bad races before. Look at how she, how she did in the BC distaff uh, where everyone had bad races at the Breeders cup. It seems like, but really, uh, you know, bounced back with the Royal Delta followed up with the apple blossom against a pretty stout field with CC and Clary air. Um, I think she's going to be able to fire. I, I, I can never tell how much of this is confidence in the horses and how much of this is just how much I love this horse. This is such a cool horse. And for a little bit, I thought she might have been the best horse in North America in training. But uh, I think it's a pace thing. I don't think anyone goes with her. Everyone is scared to go with her. I don't think anyone does. I don't think they take turns taking runs at her. I think they just let her go on the front end. So I single Latruska. I'm off the boat. I hate Damn. <laughs> Oh, no. Yeah, uh, because here's why. I know that they learned last time that search results, if she runs with her, she's just, she's winning the battle, but she's losing the war to horses like Malathat and Clarier. And search results, I think, is getting to be a much better horse this year, just like Clarier is as well. She went then to go run in the Molly Pitcher. I think that was kind of a confidence booster. But leader of the band did come back and run really well the other day in the summer colony against obviously much lesser types of company. I mean, search results is at least going to sit close. I doubt that they really hound Latruska like they did last time, but a horse that I think might kind of take up that slack and go kind of pester Latruska early is actually crazy beautiful. I was listening to an interview that was done by some of the connections earlier by one of the people that is uh, doing some of our intel on the grounds at saratoga andrew capone and they seem like they want to be a little bit more forward with crazy beautiful so i think that if that one and search results are kind of breathing down her neck maybe she is not exactly the same kind of horse that she was last year i think that that just opens it up to the horses that have shown that they're improving this year but obviously i think that a lot of people are kind of going to be done with latruska and just discount her based on what have you done for me lately and I think we all need to remember that she was the hot thing last year. And it's not like she's, you know, just disappeared off the map. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you look at the steady work tab, you have a bullet works on August 12th. Now you get the leg stretcher on August 19th. 
Uh, I mean, that just seems to be the, the, the pattern, just bullet, leg stretcher, bullet, leg stretcher. She's coming in off the leg stretcher, which to me is always just a favorite trainer workout angle. Uh, if this, if the odds stay anywhere near three to one, I'm going to need both hands to bet because they will both need to be on the wheelbarrow for, full of cash that I throw through the window at Latruska. I hear you. Um, Malathot, what's going on with her? I really... I really don't know. Um, you know, Me it's why I'm asking you. Chronic hanger, perhaps. I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, got up against, did the job in the Alabama, but I felt like it, it almost was a little bit of like packed. Or no, it was the CCA Oaks where she got kind of the the pack thing that I thought might happen to Latruska in this race, where they all kind of took turns running at her. And I don't know. It's almost like the the running style just changed over after the CCA Oaks and. I, I I wonder when Todd's going to just say, all right, just let her go again, you know? And uh, yeah. I don't know, you got Johnny V up here, so I don't think they do it this time. Um, I, I think this is one that they try to sit at the, uh, the stock, you know, stocking trip for the uh, Shadwell horse. I mean, just the shoe Vige, I picked her because I was like, you know what? She's supposed to be ahead of Clarier. And then when both of them kind of sat back and it was a very tepid pace and you could see that Johnny kind of had nothing because he was playing these tactics of like, let me keep Clarier in for as long as possible. And then I don't know. I think that we keep kind of like they tried the blinkers and then uh, Pletcher said that she was kind of dull because of the heat. And it's like, all right, what is the excuse? Because she's never really run off by open lanes to score this like super impressive margin of victory. And I think that this year Clary is just better than her. I mean, I, I would have to agree. I mean, I haven't seen anything that happened in this calendar year uh, that makes me think that that Malathat's all, all there and a horse that's really ready to make like a, a run at maybe the BC distaff or anything. Um, but at the same time, you know, second and third and $750,000 stakes rakes, races, you know, Cash checks, they pay pretty well. Right, right. Especially when there's, you know, three or four or five horses in the race, then yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's that. Um, there are at least a full field. There's at least a full field in the sword dancer coming up, mile and a half on the inner. I mean, this is a very intriguing group, but I feel like I'm kind of going through a process of elimination with most of these horses, and I have a lot of questions that there's just a lot of them that I'm kind of done with. Where did you go in here? Um, I've gotten to where I hate this division of horse racing more than any other division. Uh, you know, my buddy, Caleb, uh, Caleb Knight. Yeah. I, I picked up, he imparted upon me his hate of the older turf marathon horse division. And, um, man, I, if the figure for broom from the BC last year, is anywhere near accurate than this horse is a walkover on paper. At the same time, I don't necessarily like the idea of this horse coming from super far back. And as we discussed, it was a weird week in a Del Mar. If I'm throwing, you know, lines through winning, you know, winning trips, then I got through lines through losing trips too, or the horse ran a respectable second. Well, I mean, was it just wonky? We don't, we don't know, but I mean, you know, used to get scared when I saw Ryan Moore over for, for Aiden O'Brien, but it seems like that hasn't worked the last couple trips. But I think Broom, probably the best horse. Uh, I still kind of spread it out, though. Um, and I also used uh, Rock Emperor in uh, Soldier Rising. Um, Rock Emperor should be on or near the first run, you know, you know kind of pace uh, uh, set up. And uh, I, I, I mean, I don't like the early speed out there, so I, I think – this kind of stocking forwardly play strip will be really well, do really well. And Soldier Rising at 15 to 1, uh, running basically the exact same scenario where it could be the first horse to just show initiative and take it. Yeah, absolutely. Give me that at 15 to 1 every day. Oh, and then the nine channel maker could be the early speed. Who knows? It's wide open. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, you're going to have a situation where it's like, does Tribuban go and get to walk like he did? Um, you know, on Belmont Stakes Day and spring this huge upset when he did it like 40 to one, but instead he's going to be five to one in here because Channel Maker didn't break that day. Do you have Channel Maker getting a loan on the lead? Do you have them actually going for a huge surprise? That would probably be the biggest upset of the day. And then it sets up for somebody else. Uh, Rock Emperor to me, he's 
kind of inconsistent, but when he runs his best race, he's right there. Um, Broom, like you said, best horse in the race, but what do we get from him? I, I don't want to take a deep closer on any turf race in New York. Um, uh, I mean, Gufo is a horse that I'm totally done with. They try so many things with him. The blinker's on, the blinker's off. He's just always pace compromised, and he always takes money, and I can't trust him. Uh, with the eight, others just kind of seem better. With the 10, this horse has run well at Gulfstream and Churchill Downs, but hasn't really shown up against this kind of company, but then is also trying the mile and a half for the first time. This is going to be an all for a lot of people. But really, I think it's just kind of down to Broom and Atamo, who's, I think, kind of always been highly thought of and might just be now getting around to showing us what he's capable of. But, I mean, you could make a case for pretty much anybody in here. If they let Shabuvin walk away on the front end, I will burn down the garage in my home <laughs> out of yeah. anger. Uh, just sacrifice it to the Naira gods. I, I hate races like that, which I'm kind of rooting for with Latruska. But still... Uh, yeah, I don't think they let Shabuvin go. Um, yeah, I, Gufo, I love Gufo. That's a, that's a big time horse for me. I love that late kick. Um, has just such a great turn of foot. It just always never seems like the time shaking him up. Right. Um, you know, at the right time, but, uh, I mean, yeah, probably, probably getting towards the, the back end of the career for Gufo, but uh, it was a good one. He was really impressive for a little bit. Uh, I mean, it never really impressed me, but we all have our horses like that. So, <laughs> you know, what's funny is I was so impre- like, I was alive to a big daily double to Gufo and I'm so impressed with him, even though like he just started running late and missed like hitting it by, by a nose. It was like, man, look, did you see how fast he was flying to not win my bet? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, there's plenty of horses that I'm obsessed with that don't really win. So I can't blame you for that one. Um, getting to the Travers. This is another race where I feel like the pace scenario is kind of murky to a lot of people. And I know that some are really expecting that Epicenter is going to end up showing a lot of the early speed that he used to before the Kentucky Derby. I just don't necessarily see that happening, especially after we saw him so far back in the Jim Dandy. What do you think about the pace in here? I think he goes with uh, with early voting. Uh, and it's because that the the pace setups are just drastically different between uh, what we saw in the Jim Dandy and what we're getting here today, which is Epicenter was able to sit off of that early pace because there are all these other horses that want to be up towards the front and not necessarily like dueling and pushing early voting for the uh, for the lead, but getting close to just kind of generate that sort of pace pressure uh, that that you know horses pack animals can feel. So I I'm gonna go. I decided to go around Epicenter. And I'm going to lean into early voting at eight to one. You can't take a short price in the Travers. Like I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't force myself to do epicenter. I, I think early voting will be fine. Of course, the distance always going to be the question, but I don't think anyone's going to go with them. And if early voting just decides to kind of half-ass go with them, then I think, uh, I think, or sorry, if uh, epicenter decides to half-ass go with early voting, I think early voting just kind of leaves them at the turn. But do you have an excuse for kind of what happened last time with early voting? Because I think that that's the big red flag for me of what was the excuse last time? Well, out on the lead. So I was kind of I was trying to watch the replay because the rail has been notoriously dead this meet. And I wanted to see the kind of path that he got. It looked like he got out and cleared, but on the backstretch, maybe got into that you know, first path right off the rail. And that's been really tough to win, win off of. And it kind of explains to me why when he came off of the turn setting fairly easy fractions he just kind of came up uh empty uh and i mean hey his first race at uh at saratoga maybe just took a spin over the local track to get used to it all right that's fair enough i mean we'll see what happens i mean if he gets alone on the lead or you know even if epicenter is there bothering him at least a little bit i don't see them going super fast early on i mean He's already beat Epicenter before, so at least you have that in your corner. Rich Strike, I mean, to me, he's less likely a winner than Ain't Life Grand and Gilded Age. Right. Yeah, I, also another horse that was very much uh, Fortune's favorite son because, I mean, every just a million things had to work out perfectly for Rich Strike to win. Uh, that's not – no knock. They When everything worked perfectly, they got there and, and won. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't see any sort of just like – smoking hot you know kentucky derby type fractions to really set up rich strike but hey man 
another another son of Keen Ice. Do we get like a, a, a Keen Ice to Electric Boogaloo with Rich Strike? Who knows? Uh, Zandon five to one from the far outside. I've been in the Zandon camp for quite some time. He just needs to beat Epicenter, and he hasn't yet. And I've seen it a cu- a couple times, but. I think also we have to remember the trainer intent was always win the Travers with him. So have they been pointing for this all along and they've kind of saved the best for this race? Is it just the case that he's not ever going to get by epicenter until we have a situation where maybe they're both four-year-olds in race against each other, kind of like the Clarier and Malathot matchup. Artorias could be a big deal, but I, I mean, I didn't really want to take that chance at nine to two, but if he drifts up a little bit, maybe that's the one that I, I kind of look at as that funky long shot that I'm really intrigued by because that was a very impressive performance in the Curlin. But I mean, I think we just end up epicenter is the best horse in the race. That trip in the gym dandy last time, Joel Rosario was going to have Twitter set a flame with that ride if he did not get there, but he looked like an absolute genius because he rode with so much confidence and it worked out. And I think that we're looking at maybe Epicenter finally stamping himself as, yes, I am the top of this division, could have been, should have been in the running for possibly a triple crown, except for some crazy scenarios. You know, it's I, I can't remember which TVG analyst has brought this up before, but he always brings it up in regards to like horses running in like the same level of claimers in the same circuit of like eventually it's just one of their turns. And that's kind of how it feels with some of these horses here because they've run against each other at so many different points between, you know, the Kentucky Derby Trail uh, and then, you know, even just coming out of some of the same uh, some of the same, you know, bases of operation. But I, I decided to keep it skinny. I'm going to go early voting. I'm going to go Zandon. And this is once again, a place where I go ahead and, and toss the favorite. And so I lean into one favorite and then I just try to, you know, go wide and, and go around. Um, I will say cyber knife. Maybe this, all right. Gun runner was a late mature. Maybe cyber knife is just kind of growing into his three-year-old body. And he's really like tuned for a good into the three-year-old into the four-year-old campaign. What do you think? this is one of those hills that I'm going to die on until he wins the Travers. Um, and so I hope that for all of his fans, I'm the one that puts him in the winner's circle for you because I've just been against this horse big time on the hill that I just don't think he's that good in the Derby. I mean, kind of a nothing effort and granted there's a lot of horses that show a nothing effort and that's fine. And they move forward and progress and become, you know, much more serious competitors later on in their career. The Haskell, he rode the rail. That was a good race. You can't take it away from him. But at the same time, that was the day where the track was playing like pavement and everybody was getting a super fast time because of the way that things were going. I think there was a track record that was broken in one race and then broken a couple races later again. Mm -hmm. And he beat a sprinter and a horse that also didn't show up in the Derby. And he could barely get by Howling Time a couple starts ago at Churchill Downs. And what price would Howling Time be in this race? So for me with Cyberknife, it's like, who has he really been able to finish ahead of? And who has he really been beaten by in here that I think is just better than him? I think the horses that have run better than he has that are in the Travers just so outclass him. But if you just make the argument, maybe he's better now. This isn't the same kind of animal we saw in the Kentucky Derby. Is the price really worth it to ask that question? And for me, it's not. It needs to float quite a bit. Uh, it needs to float quite a bit. I, I think basically the deal with Cyberknife is that Cyberknife um, just has, I feel like, elite tactical speed. When the tactics fit out and he's able to to use it to his advantage, like he gets the job done. Uh, it's kind of what he did in the uh, the Arkansas Derby, kind of what he did in the Haskell. I just don't think that the tactics are there for him to use the tactical speed here. Um, you know, it's hard to go against the Flocox, but... Still, I, I try to get around Cyberknife also. Yeah, I mean, you are dealing with the only trainer that has won this race. So. There we go. There we go. <laughs> uh, all right. Well. It means, it means someone else is due. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, I mean, no matter what, 
this doesn't exactly scream, this is my best betting card that I've ever seen in my life with the opinions that I have in here. But it's also going to be a really exciting day of racing. And I just remember Trevor's Day last year, a lot of favorites won and they were very formful outcomes. But you had a lot of long shots filling out your exotics. And I think that that's going to end up ultimately being the similar approach that I take in here of favorite somewhere in there that makes perfect sense and then try to get some prices in underneath. And that's kind of how I'm going to be playing these races on Saturday, but mostly I'm just going to be watching and hope to be treated to some really exciting performances. And it's, it's wild to think that Saratoga is almost over. We're almost basically more than halfway done with the year of racing. Yeah. And then we get uh permaduct uh, until, <laughs> until next spring which hey mm-hmm. i love the duct i got i got no complaints there yeah uh should be a good i i hope latruska just absolutely freaks just run runs a hole through the wind um because that's my that's my girl right there um and yeah i mean maybe maybe i'm right some of these long these uh these short prices go down and i get some of these longer shots yeah i mean you're gonna get paid if that's the case so wishing the best for you Where can people find you and all of your racing selections online and on the HRN website? Yeah, sure. Uh, You can always find me being abrasive on Twitter at of Oaklawn Uh, picks. I do for Saratoga most days, uh, 999. uh, And it's uh, at uh, uh, picks.horseracingnation.com. You can find me in the, uh, the expert picks section, uh, Wolf of Saratoga. And um, yeah, that is, uh, that's it. I've got the podcast, the notorious OTB. I've, the AUDL, that's right, Ultimate First Big Gambling Podcast, the Tilted Land Shark Podcast, and then I've also got a Z Run, that's right, NFT horse racing <laughs> show that I do. So I'm around. You're around. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time and for coming on, and good luck to you this weekend. Thank you. Same to you.